Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our final lecture of the fall 2022 lecture series entitled Race, Security and Empire, hosted by the Rutgers Center for Security, Race and Rights. We, this is part of a year long lecture series, which will start up again in spring 2023. Uh, the Center for Security, Race, and Rights is the first and only civil rights center at a U.S. law school that focuses primarily on Muslim, Arab, South Asian, civil and human rights through a transnational, cross-racial, and interfaith approach. And so today's lecture is part of our broader mission to engage in public education about these various intersecting topics. Uh, and it's certainly my distinct pleasure to be hosting uh, Dr. Farid Hafiz uh, for his lecture on European Islamophobia. And before I formally introduce Dr. Hafiz, I will just encourage everyone to learn more about the Center for Security, Race and Rights by visiting our website at csrr.rutgers.edu and also by following us on social media at Twitter, uh, the tag is at RUCSRR and on Instagram, it's Rutgers CSRR. We are always uh, sharing information and the latest news on issues affecting uh, these diverse communities. So it is truly an honor today to introduce to you a colleague and someone that I consider a friend uh, to educate us and enlighten us about a very timely, important, and troubling a topic and phenomena, European Islamophobia. Uh, Dr. Farid Hafiz is currently class of 1955 visiting professor of international studies at Williams College. Since, since 2017, he has also been a resident researcher at Georgetown University's The Bridge Initiative. Before he was a senior researcher uh, he, at the University of Salzburg from 2014 to 2021. And in 2016, Dr. Hafiz was a Fulbright uh, Botsiber Visiting Professor of Austrian American Studies at the University of California, Berkeley Center for Race and Gender. And previously in 2014, he was visiting scholar at the Middle East Institute uh, at Columbia University in New York. Uh, and today he's going to bring this wealth of expertise from these various academic positions, but he's also for been serving since 2010 as the founding editor of the Islamophobia Studies Yearbook. And since 2015, he's been the co-editor of the annual European uh, report, European Islamophobia report. Uh, Dr. Hafiz has published more than 120 book chapters and academic articles. Since 2020, Hafiz has also been a ed board editor of the Journal of Austrian American History, and he has taught and studied race, far-right politics in Europe, Muslim minorities, and political thought. And his latest books include the monograph Islamophobia on, main on Mainstreaming Racism, and the anthology, Coloniality, Race, and Islam, The Rise of Global Islamophobia in the War on Terror. And I would remiss, be remiss not to mention that Dr. Farid Hafiz is also a contributor to a forthcoming edited volume that I'm co-editing with Dr. John Esposito that is called Global Islamophobia in an Era of Populism. Uh, so he is by far the leading expert on uh, global Islamophobia and especially on uh, Islamophobia in Europe. So in, in, without further ado, uh, I will give the virtual floor to Dr. Hafiz. Welcome to the Center for Security, Race and Rights Lecture Series. And thank you so much for generously sharing your time and your expertise. And we look forward uh, to learning from you today. Thank you so much. And thank you, Professor Sahar Aziz. Uh, thank you for having me here and giving me this virtual floor. Uh, it's always an honor and a pleasure to be a part of uh, such a series uh, dedicated to discussing critical issues of our times in a historical and uh, from a, also from a very much from a post-imperial and post-colonial perspective. Now, I, I would like to start uh, my talk with uh, a, a short quote uh, that was uh, given by um, a very uh, recognized politician of the mainstream, um, 
who is actually the high representative of the European Union for foreign affairs and security policy. Uh, himself um, a member of the Social Democratic Party. So we're speaking about a centrist left person, right? Um, and not long ago, a month and a half, uh, he gave a talk. Um, and during this talk, one of the things that he said was, um, quote unquote, Europe is a garden. Most of the rest of the world is a jungle. The jungle could invade the garden. The gardeners should take care of it. The jungle has a strong growth capacity. The wall will never be high enough in order to protect the garden. The gardeners have to go into the jungle. European, Europeans have to be engaged much more with the world." End quote. Now, the reason I'm bringing this quote and starting my, my, my talk uh, with that is because um, very often when we think about Islamophobia, especially in the case of Europe, we think about the rise of right-wing populism, we think about um, underground neo-Nazi um, movements and organizations who kill people and so on and so forth. But I think one of the real problems that we are facing when we're talking about Islamophobia in Europe is really how much uh, mainstream politicians um, are reproducing um, a structural inequality between what is perceived as the Muslim other and the rest, um, well, not the rest of the society, but the white dominant culture that we see. Now, obviously, I mean, if, if I would give this quote that I just gave and, uh, and say somebody in the late 19th century who would, were, was a colonial uh, governor somewhere in an African country uh, would have said that, I think nobody would be astonished. But how comes that somebody in the year 2022 representing the European Union, which it conceives of itself as being a project of freedom, um, a project uh, that is uh, informed by enlightenment thought and that stands for pluralism and human rights. How can it happen that somebody like that speaks the way he does, right? Speaking of Europe as a garden, the rest of the world as a jungle. Uh, speaking also of uh, and explicitly mentioning that <laughs> this jungle has to be protected uh, by, by, by walls. Um, and everything that comes to your mind uh, that is implicated by that is that there are thousands of people coming to Europe every year as immigrants from uh, Middle East and Northern Africa, um, but also from Asian countries, um, Iraq and Syria first and foremost, but also Afghanistan. Um, and in fact, most of these people who are the immigrants are also at the very same time, uh, not only people of color, but they are also people who belong to the Muslim religion. So there is this idea that is implicated, I think very much in this quote, that tells us that there is a barrier, a barrier and the self-conception of Europe as the enlightened civilized place that has basically to civilize the other. Something which is very reminiscent of the colonial discourse in the late 19th century, when Europeans went out to the world to civilize um, the colonized subjects. Now, therefore, I think one of the problems that we are facing when we talk about Islamophobia is in fact, what some historians have called the colonial amnesia of Europe, right? And a lot of historians, when they talk about that, what they mean is that there is a perception of Europe that it is untouched by its own colonial history. To give you one example, like when we speak, for instance, about Germany and the history of National Socialism, the idea very often in the German public, for instance, in regards to National Socialism is that it was an interruption of the history. It was something that is not really conceived of as being related to a larger history of colonial expansion, nor to a larger history of race, of a global racial hierarchy that sees the white as the as superior in that uh, hierarchy uh, um, or, or the empire, 
Um, and along with that goes also the perception that today's Europe is being is untouched by race matters. So we have very much in, in continental Europe, and I would say in all over Europe, except of the uh, Anglos, uh, uh, Anglophone world, which is the UK, um, this idea that after 1945, after the end of the Second World War, after the end of the Nazi regime, and after the end of the Holocaust, race does not matter anymore. And we are a colorblind continent. So this imagination and self-perception of Europe as this colorblind continent, um, where basically there is no difference in terms of along the lines of nationality and, and ethnicity, um, that also implies that the post-colonial subjects are actually positioned outside of European history. So in a way, um, as some scholars like Fatima al Taib, for instance, have argued, um, what we see here is the exclusion of colonialism from the presence of Europe. And that leads to this externalization of the po post-colonial subjects and populations. Um, and colonialism basically is not conceived as any kind of key event that has shaped contemporary Europe. Now, the reason I'm talking about like this, all of this history is because it complicates and makes it so difficult to speak about Islamophobia. Why? Because very similar to anti-Semitism, um, more than a hundred years ago, um, the general public in Europe would speak, and I can just remind you of Karl Marx and many other authors who have spoken about that this way, they related to the question of Jews in Europe as the so-called Jewish question. Now, looking at it in retrospective, we can say, well, that was about anti-Semitism, right? It was not about a real Jewish question there, or as some critical Jewish scholars called it, the real question was actually never the Jewish question, it was the German question. As much as there was never in the United States the end question, the question about black people, but rather there was a white question and whites had to ask themselves, why do they need this imagination about the black person? Similar to that in Europe, people related to the so-called Jewish question as a real question. So now when we speak about Islamophobia today, you will see, see that a lot of people are actually denying that there is something that we call Islamophobia. And that is still very widespread in European policy circles. So to an extent that even if they accept there is a problem called Islamophobia, they would argue that, well, but there is also Islamic terrorism. So, you know, there is a reason for why we have these prejudices. No, you know, those stereotypes, they have a grounding in the reality. Um, and that makes it very complicated to really have an honest conversation about Islamophobia uh, in Europe itself. Now, again, that does not mean that there are no people speaking about Islamophobia in Europe, obviously. Um, and I think there was a key moment uh, with uh, the terrorist attack of Anders Bering Breivik in 2011. Um, for those of you who uh, do not uh, remember, Anders Bering Breivik was a white supremacist killing 77 people in Oslo and Utøya in Norway, um, allegedly defending white Christian, the white Christian uh, Europe um, against uh, an Islamization or an Islamic invasion, an invasion by Muslims that would be enhanced by social democratic and other liberal forces within Europe that are open to immigration. So therefore he went basically to a camp of socialist youth or the socialist youth uh, chapter of the social democratic party um, and killed uh, a bunch of young people there. Um, now, the reason I'm, I'm mentioning this is because Anders Bering Breivik could not be denied anymore. And it could not be denied that this was very much related to a very explicit Islamophobic ideology. He basically killed people 
because he believed the 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 continent would be swamped over by by Muslim populations, immigrants. And that changed something. If you look into the media coverage, um, 2011 was the moment when Islamophobia as a terminology even emerged in the public uh, in the public square much more than ever before. Now, at the very same time, and, and looking back at what happened the last 11 years, in this year in March, the United Nations unanimously um, accepted a resolution on behalf of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation uh, to declare the 15th of March, which marked uh, the anniversary of uh, the New Zealand uh, attack again that killed 51 Muslim people in two mosques. Um, it accepted a resolution that called the 15th of March the International Day to Combat Islamophobia uh, in, in commemoration of this Christchurch attack in New Zealand. <clears throat> now, it is interesting that this resolution was accepted unanimously. But at the very same time, what we see is the European reaction was quite interesting to observe. So there were actually three uh, voices that, that challenged their resolution. One was India. And again, I think in terms of Islamophobia, we should not be astonished at all. There is uh, an awful dimension of killing, destruction, and exclusion going on in India in these days. But it was also two other, besides India, two other voices. On the one hand, the representative of France, and on the other hand, the representative of the European Union, who has no, uh, 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 who is only there as a delegate with no voting rights. But still, those were the three uh, voices that contested the, the resolution. And they, the, the critique they expressed during uh, the, uh, the deliberations was that According to them, um, they basically they do not want really to tackle Islamophobia, I would argue, especially in terms of France, um, because what is going on and what we are witnessing uh, uh, during these days uh, in, in countries like France is very much that the state itself becomes the primary actor of Islamophobia. And what we are witnessing is a state Islamophobia of cracking down uh, against a lot of Muslim civil societies. So they were talking about like, well, a resolution against Islamophobia could silence any kind of critique vis-a-vis -vis Islam. So we should discuss this. But at the end of the day, again, they very much accepted it. Now, why, why has the delegate of the European Union expressed critique? Now, there is an interesting uh, institutional aspect to that in regards to the European Union. Because in December 2015, a, create, a, a position was created uh, that was called the Coordinate on Anti-Muslim Hatred. Now, this position's mandate uh, was to address anti-Muslim hate speech and hate crimes and discrimination. It was not tackling like racism as an institutional problem that would in itself question a lot of uh, the institutional aspects of the European Union itself. And there have been um, a lot of concerns also in terms of the mandate that this position had. But what is interesting is that uh, this position has been void since the end of July, 2021, more than a year now. So we can see the reluctance of a lot of European institutions in itself in tackling Islamophobia. Uh, to give you also, a put this in a bit, bit of a comparative perspective, there is a resolution by the European Parliament against anti-Semitism. There is a resolution that exists against anti-Gypsyism, but there is no resolution against Islamophobia, right? And that again tells you something about the willingness or the silence that exists on behalf of large parts of the European Parliament that are directly elected by uh, European uh, uh, nation populations in terms of how willing or unwilling they are in, uh, in regard to um, even creating a consciousness and doing something against Islamophobia. Um, now, I could speak about a lot of 
institutional problems, talk about several cases, but I really want to focus on, on two major issues here. Um, also in terms of maybe having a US audience uh, in this virtual room, um, to speak a little bit about the, 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 the differences that we see um, in, in contrast to the United States. Now, I think one of the, in, one of, uh, one of the most important aspects in what shapes uh, European nation states policies vis-a-vis -vis its Muslim populations is a very different understanding of what secularism means. Although not every European nation state a single nation state has the very same pattern in terms of how it governs its uh, uh, the state authorities' relationships to churches and uh, and other denominations. What we find in most, although not every European nation state, is that there is an understanding of, to some sort, a privileging of the dominant Christian churches. Um, although that is, again. There is no uniform way of how to do that. There still is this conception of a lot of European nation states conceiving of themselves as being not representing a specific Christian church, although we do also have that, for instance, in the UK um, and, and, and other in some uh, Scandinavian countries. But there is this idea that there is a cooperative relationship between state authorities and churches especially in countries like Germany, for instance, or Austria, where I, where I originally come from. Um, what is most important here is that, especially in the mid 2000 years, around 2005, six, seven, there was an emerging um, idea on behalf of the ministries of the interior that they are actually in charge of the Muslim communities. While other churches and denominations as political institutions were always related to by the state authorities that were in charge of cultural or educational affairs. So you can already see in terms of the institutional approach that European nation states primarily perceived their Muslim citizens or their Muslim populations as a security threat. And that's why the Ministry of Interior had to deal with it. Now, several European uh, countries like Germany and France and Austria and, 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 and the Netherlands and, and even um, England to an extent have implemented a lot of policies based on the idea of countering violent extremism, similar to the stories that you know from the US. And as you know, that has been in, in fact a global phenomenon. We had the UN resolutions that were basically um, advising its uh, member states to introduce uh, CVE pr projects in order to counter radicalization. And we, we have seen throughout the last 10, 15 years that this has very much disproportionately affected the Muslim communities and even the Fundamental Rights Agency of the European Union uh, has previously published a report where it warned that this is very much endangering basic rights of especially the Muslim community. Nevertheless, what we can see, especially within the last three to four years, and I would say it is very much also related to the Arab Spring, is that a number of countries have started um, becoming like the main drivers of a form of uh, Islamophobic politics that is uh, implemented by uh, <clears throat> the government itself. I have mentioned France, and I think France alongside Austria together has become the major driving force in implementing a sort of um, state Islamophobia that is in fact, in a way, criminalizing the Muslim community. So in the name not of, um, and, and you know, the, the way they have uh, done so was not by co-opting in a pure way, the very racist far-right policies that have been claimed for uh, in, the, in the last couple of years. But what they did is they basically reframed the problem as being uh, 
a political problem, not a problem of religion. In a way, by arguing that we want to defend the rights of the vast majority of Muslims, and we even want to support the, the vast majority of Muslims who are um, peaceful people, that was kind of the discourse um, to, um, to protect them from what they now framed as being in France, Islamist separatism, or in Austria, political Islam, um, or in Germany, legalistic Islamism. So the idea that they introduced was basically um, to defend the vast majority of Muslims against what they saw as a form of political manipulation of Islam. Now, the problem with that is that these governments, what they meant when they talked about Islamist separatism or political Islam, was not so much a form of a political degenerated version of Islam, but rather it was Islam itself. To give you a few examples, when for instance, the hijab ban was introduced in Austria, the argument was that the headscarf was a symbol of political Islam. When, when mosques were closed, again, the argument was, we are cracking down on political Islam, not on Muslim civil society. So in a way, what that helped to do is um, positioning uh, the Islamophobic and framing the Islamophobic discriminatory policies as not in contradiction to human rights and religious freedom, but rather as a legitimate way to secure uh, the rights of the vast majority of Muslims, protect them against the evil of political Islam, and also frame this as a security measure. And in that way, um, a lot of these policies could also go unnoticed because there was no huge outcry because the way it was framed was very much in this uh, liberal um, uh, kind of uh, discourse of uh, being aligned to human rights and, and, and religious freedom. And, the way how I see this, these policies uh, evolving over time is very much um, similar to what I see as a, this general political uh, uh, demonization that we had, for instance, in the United Sa uh, States when Senator Joseph McCarthy in the 1950s started this kind of witch hunt against black and left wing groups under the banner of basically fighting communism. So the way how in the age of the Cold War era, uh, these anti-communist policies were legitimized against any kind of political opposition on a domestic level. Similar to that, we can see today how political Islam is being uh, portrayed as this great danger that has to that is uh, basically a, a, a threat to the domestic uh, security of those European nation states. But in both cases, like fundamental rights such as freedom of expression, freedom of association, and freedom of re religion are very much at risk. And we could see that with a lot of uh, Muslim associations that have been closed down in France uh, in the name of fighting Islamist separatism, even uh, anti-racist uh, watchdogs like uh, the uh, most prominently uh, the uh, collective against Islamophobia in France that was closed again with the argument that um, accusing the French state of st uh, state Islamophobia is a dividing um, the French society and is in a way um, also um, a a a posing a security threat because it is radicalizing um, um, uh, the future generation. And therefore, um, based on, on, on terrorism, anti-terrorism legislation, that watchdog was uh, closed down. So these are just like a few examples of where I see a very dangerous um, development currently uh, in some of the European nation states that are uh, endangering their own Muslim communities in the name um, of anti-terrorism legislation, in the name of um, social cohesion um, that is also, uh, in many ways also very troubling in terms of uh, the potential critique that could uh, emerge coming from uh, critical NGOs, but also critical scholars working on these issues. Um, when 
a couple of years ago in, in, in 2020, when the French government was basically accusing uh, critical scholars of importing uh, gender studies, post-colonial studies and critical race theory from the US to divide the French society, or the Danish case where we had the, a parliament resolution that was asking uh, scholars not to be involved in politics, or even in cases where uh, we see that Islamophobia studies is being reframed as an attempt to create a worldwide caliphate. All of these examples are examples where we see that all kind of pushback coming from critical scholarship is in, in itself being reframed as a form of terrorism that has to be stopped uh, in order to save the cohesion of the national, uh, uh, national body. So I will stop here and I'm um, looking forward to having an interesting conversation. Thank you so much, Dr. Hafiz. We have a lot of uh, fascinating questions in the Q&A. So those who are in attendance, please put your questions in the Zoom function. I'm going to use my, pro my moderator's prerogative just to identify some themes and then maybe start us off with a question. Um, you know, so as somebody who researches uh, anti-Muslim racism and Islamophobia in the US, I can't help but see many of the parallels. And I'm hoping that today we can unpack and show the differences and the similarities since we do have a, a large American audience. Um, so the, the first uh, issue that, that or theme that comes to mind is this uh, misnomer, right? Or this connection between Islamic terrorism and Islam, the religion, and therefore, when, when states or actors are engaging in what we would consider Islamophobia, you know, they argue, no, we're just engaging in rational, smart, patriotic national security practices and policies. And so that is certainly a large theme or a undermining, underpinning theme here in the US. Uh, and yet, and this is a question that I, I wanna ask you specifically about Europe, and yet uh, we have this rise of white right-wing extremism and political violence. I wouldn't even call it extremism because that could be simply having extreme political mm -hmm. beliefs, which in the US context is completely legal and some would argue very American. Uh, but once you start acting on, on those beliefs in, through violence or violating the law, then you are no longer in the safe zone of protection, at least legal protection and even social acceptance. Um, and yet we're not seeing churches being subjected to countering violent extremism programs. We're not seeing white men who often tend to be the most common demographic of mass shootings, uh, or, or especially when it's in the form of racial violence. We're not seeing uh, white conservatives, Christians, who believe that uh, the state should prohibit abortion on their religious beliefs grounds or believe that church uh, religion should be taught in schools or believe that state funds should go towards paying private uh, religious schools expenses. Um, so there are many people that uh, are what I call the Christian brotherhood right in the US. And yet they are not subjected to nearly, if any, uh, state persecution or, or state attack and, and social stigma that those who were uh, pejoratively termed political Islamists, or as you said, uh, political Islamist, legalistic Islamism, and Islamist separatism. That's interesting that there are these different terms. I think here everybody just gets con congealed into one. Um, and so I, the, the question is based, is really what, how is Europe dealing with this rise of the far right, which I think is even much more on display in Europe because they're winning in elections and they are organized political parties as opposed to, yes, we had that as the base of our president, you know, Donald Trump, our former president, and we certainly had, they were the driving force for the attempted insurrection, but uh, the Republican Party at least does not as openly claim that it is as far right as, as some of the European parties. Um, so I, uh, the question again is, how, how is Europe, and I know there are so many different countries, so I, I don't want you to generalize the entire continent, but if you want to use some case studies, but how are yeah. they dealing with this problem? All right. Now, I think that's an interesting uh, question, and let me give a historical uh, lens as well as a more contemporary um, uh, um, pro uh, problematization. Now, on the one hand, um, let me speak about Germany. Okay, Germany, why? Because it's an important country. It's one of the two leading countries in the European Union. Nothing goes without Germany or France. Um, 
in Germany, after the, the end of the, of the Nazi regime, um, the Ministry of Interior and a lot of the intelligence service people, um, there was some sort of continuity between the political order before the Nazi regime and post, the post-war German, German political order. Um, even in a country like where I come from, uh, Austria, the Ministry of Interior, when you find when you see elections for the unions, it is the strongest ministry um, with the highest percentage of far right support, a third at least. All right. So there is historically speaking, I think what we have to recognize um, a, a linkage between the fascist era and what we see today in Europe. And we should not underestimate that. Um, even one like the, the, the former head of the German secret service, uh, Bundesamt für Verfassungsschutz in Germany, after he uh, uh, retired from his position, he was very openly embracing the, the far right alternative for Germany, right? Um, a lot of their policy claims. So, he was always very silent during his tenure. But what does, again, that tell us about the ideology that is prevalent in many of those institutions? Now, that is a problem. Why? Because looking back for the, the German case, and there was one very uh, prominent case, the so-called NSU case, National Socialist uh, Underground. W within 10 to 15 years, there were several killings of people of color, people who were owning uh, kebab stores, like serving traditional Turkish food. And the media coverage throughout those 10, 15 years was there is an, eth an inner ethnic conflict amongst immigrants, amongst people of color. Now, many, many years after that, it came to the, it became more public that actually the ones who killed those people, all of those people, were part and parcel of a, an underground right wing movement. And the Secret Service was aware of it, but he would not speak out. Now, if we assume that the far right underground is a problem for these European nation states. And it is to some extent. Uh, actually, just today in the morning, there was a huge raid <laughs> in Germany and also in some other countries for people who uh, wanted basically to uh, create a new political order, uh, the so-called Reichsbürger, uh, which is also in, in a way a very far right conspiratory uh, uh, group. Um, even if we assume that some of those that, that there are links between the nationalist underground and some parts of the administration, especially in the in the departments of defense and departments of interior uh, affairs. The problem has grown. And I'll just give you one example. In 2019, there was a mainstream uh, German uh, politician from the Christian Democratic Union, Walter Lübcke, who was killed on his private balcony by a sniper who most probably has been, um, uh, who has been part of a far right uh, 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 underground movement. And one of the things that they found during one of the raids was a list with 20,000 names of people who were pro-immigration. Now, it was never disclosed, so we don't know were those people, including also like people of color who were leading civil society organizations? Was it just like including uh, mainstream politicians who were pro-multiculturalism, pro-immigration? But it definitely showed like the amount, the extent of the problem that is existing. Um, still, we would see that the overall public discourse has not shifted to, well, we see homegrown kind of white uh, supremacism uh, uh, as a problem. But still, the, the main discourse continues to be around uh, the Muslim problem. So I doubt that it will 
profoundly change something unless there is a major event that happens that would wake up larger parts of the public. Well, th thank you. Thank you, first of all, for having me. Um, it, it was a great opportunity to discuss uh, a couple of interesting points and aspects to this discussion. Um, um, you know, being somebody uh, who left Europe also because of Islamophobia to a large extent and now being a resident of the United States and thinking about uh, and also to, to an extent also having in mind that there are similar a lot of similar people like me who are leaving Europe because they they see that there is a, a growing danger of simply living as a, as a common person uh, and continuing one's life that is threatened by a lot of this violence that we see, not violence in the sense of the radical right only, but structural violence that just does not allow for Muslim people to live a, a normal life. Um, I, I really would more as a policy recommendation say, uh, keep your eyes on, on, on countries like Denmark, like France, like Austria, uh, that are at the forefront of, of uh, problematizing Muslims in a very institutionalized and very often not visible way but that really harms Muslim life while at the very same time trying to position themselves as defenders against anti-Semitism and the Jewish life, but at the very same time basically taking no lesson of what whatsoever happened with anti-Semitism in Europe. So therefore, um, I think, yeah, um, this is just like a personal wish note at this point uh, to say, um, keep your eyes open and, and try to keep up the conversation, create a consciousness that there is really a problem that is going on. And I, I think even, you know, the State Department, US State Department's last uh, year's uh, uh, reports on religion, international religious freedom by the international, the Office of International Religious Freedom could be read even as to some extent an Islamophobia report. Um, so it really shows us that this is a problem also uh, state institutions see uh, that is uh, uh, of growing concern to a lot of people in Europe and the world. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Farid Hafiz. Uh, it was an honor to have you. Thank you, everyone who attended. My name is Sahar Aziz. I'm the, the professor of law and chancellor of social justice scholar at Rutgers Law School and the director of the Center for Security, Race, and Rights. And I'll just end by encouraging everybody to visit our website at csrr.rutgers.com. .edu, uh, register for our uh, next lecture series. And uh, I wish everybody a um, wonderful day and a restful holiday season. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. Assalamu